All righty, everyone. We're gonna go ahead and just uh, and just get started. There's a lot of uh, a lot of stuff to get by uh, today. Uh, well, welcome everybody to our main meeting. We are almost halfway done with with our year. Interestingly enough, um, of course, as every year with our main meeting, we uh, we always start with our our annual meeting, uh, which is where we vote on the new board. Um, for the uh, the next uh, for the next following two two years, um, so let me pull up the uh, the agenda. Only a couple of points, just so that everyone can get a uh, a reference on it. Yeah, we're live, so they can they can hear. We have quite a few people joining us on YouTube, and thank you guys for joining us uh, here in person today. Um, so we just have a couple of points. Go over. So I'll officially call the meeting to order. Um, the uh, the first item on today's agenda for the annual meeting is to uh, vote to approve the minutes from last year's meeting, so the 2021 minutes. Uh, if everyone uh, has had a chance to uh, to look at the minutes, they were sent with the uh, with the newsletter um, for for the uh, for May. Uh, and it kind of just reviews everything from from uh, from last year. Um, would anyone like to motion to accept the uh, to approve the meeting? All right. No. Um, so a bit of a uh, discussion. Uh, I would like to just um, to point out a a typo uh, for uh, from. The previous year's minutes for item one, where it first says motion to accept the the minus. Uh, just want to amend that so that it reads uh, motion to accept the the minutes for 2019. <laughs> okay. Um, and then. Uh, other typo that I found um, is for item two, uh, where it says two year terms for Lydia Cuny as secretary and Alan Frank at director at large, uh, that at should be as director at large. Oh, are you all right with that change? I see, good. Uh, does anyone else have any other corrections or anything else they'd like to discuss for the meeting minutes? All righty. Uh, so let's take it to a vote. So all in favor to approve the meeting minutes, say aye. 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 Any opposed, nay. Any abstentions? Looks like it's unanimous. So the second item on, uh, on the agenda is to vote to approve the, uh, the proposed 2022 uh, board slate. Um, so our slate as proposed is for uh, president, myself, Brian Diaz, which is a, a two-year term uh, for Vice President uh, Steve Woodmancy, also a two-year term. Uh, we have four director at large positions. Um, three of them are two-year, and those two-year terms are for Jeannie Rothschild, who would be uh, continuing her service on the board, uh, Joey Basna, who will also be uh, continuing his service on the board, um, First new board member for a two-year term is Ricky Bonema, uh, who's not here today, but just to introduce Ricky, uh, she works at the Miami Beach uh, Botanical Garden as a horticulturist. Uh, she worked with Sana O'Sullivan, um, who is uh, leaving uh, the board the board this year. Uh, she's very passionate about learning about native plants, and she's very, um, uh, she's very excited to be able to work with us and, and create ties with both the garden and with other, other plant organizations. Um, the final director at large position, which is a one year term, uh, we nominate Gwen Brzezicki. Many of you know Gwen, she's been very active in the native plant world for many, many years. Uh, she used to be uh, the president of the, uh, of, of the chapter. Um, and, uh, and she also worked at uh, Miami-Dade County Durham for, for many, many years. Uh, her primary role now is, uh, is with the group uh, Bound by Beauty, where she's trying to engage folks to learn about 
um, about native plants and their role in keeping communities healthy by using butterflies as that as that vector. Um, she's not able to join us today either, uh, but she is joining us via via YouTube. Uh, so, would anyone like to uh, motion to approve the slate as proposed? All right, Patty. Uh, any discussion for the slate? All right. So all in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed nay? Any abstentions? And looks like that's unanimous as well. So that's uh, that's those are the only two items that we have for uh, this year's annual meeting. Would anyone like to motion to close out the meeting? Ben and Janine. All right. Um, all opposed? Aye. 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 Any opposed nay? Abstentions. All right. Thank you, guys. So, this. All right. So usually we have uh, we have a, a full page of announcements of events that are coming up. Just because we have a, quite a few things uh, going on today, we're going to, just in the interest of time, um, skip through the announcements uh, on upcoming events. Um, however, if you want to, uh, to get a bit more information on upcoming events, then I would like to point you guys to the, uh, the, the chapter calendar, which is on that link uh, that you see on the board, um, as well as the newsletter. Uh, if you're not a, a member, uh, and you'd like to receive the newsletter, there's a sign-up sheet for it in the back of the room. It would be for the, the, upcoming, uh, the upcoming newsletter, just so you can kind of get more information on, on upcoming things. Um, just one thing I'd like to point out, since it's, uh, since it's kind of new, uh, there's going to be the FMPS, so the Statewide Organization um, Annual Conference, which is gonna be held virtually. Uh, that's gonna happen on June 25th. Uh, it's where they're gonna elect the the annual meeting, sorry. Uh, so the annual meeting, so it's it's their version of what we just had today, where they're gonna vote for the statewide organization's um, uh, board, as well as distribute the, uh, the awards and the grants. Uh, it's a good way to learn about FMPS's accomplishments over the years, so I highly recommend uh, tuning in. Okay, so, Last thing I wanna do is just take a couple minutes um, with us kind of being away from each other, not seeing each other's faces for a couple of years. You know, we got back to, uh, to in-person meetings back in March, but um, you know, I just wanna kind of give a few moments to, uh, to recognize a few special contributions uh, to the chapter and then to offer uh, our gratitude for those, uh, for those contributions as well. It's kind of not as many folks folks as we usually have here, but um, I'm hoping that they're tuning in virtually. Uh, and I'd like to recognize just a few folks. Uh, so firstly, I want to recognize the um, uh, Susan Walcott and uh, Jim Wheeler, who usually uh, have the, the merchandise table set up. It is quite a, an undertaking to always have all those materials, you know, all the books, all the pamphlets, all the things that, that we have on the merchandise table. And they always, um, you know, they always they, they volunteered for, for many years to kind of keep all those all those materials and they always bring them um, to uh, to each event. So all the wonderful books that we have is thanks to uh, to Susan and Jim. Um, Jim additionally is a regular at bringing uh, plants to the raffle table. Uh, we have quite a few quite a few uh, today. Um, I'd also like to uh, recognize Caniel Pulido, uh, who is the, uh, the uh, chapter's webmaster. So if you go onto our website and you see the beautiful, uh, the beautiful layout of everything, and you see all the uh, all the past articles, all the past newsletters, and uh, and upcoming events on the calendar. That's uh, largely thanks to Hanyo for uh, for uploading those. Um, a very special uh, recognition I'd like to give to Patty Fairs. If you guys knew the amount of work that Patty puts in putting the newsletter together every single month your minds would explode. It's, it's a lot that goes into, um, into, into the newsletter. It's a lot of communicating with everyone, a lot of uh, getting information and, and you know, tying it all in. Um, and in addition to doing that 
every single month. She also oversees the Everglades National Park uh, work days, um, which we have one coming up. Definitely check out the calendar if you'd like more, more information on that. Uh, so thank you, thank you, Patty. Um, exiting the board this year is Sana O'Sullivan. Uh, Sana was with us for, uh, for two years. Um, she was a very great benefit to the, uh, to the board. She brought in a lot of very fresh, uh, fresh ideas and she was also instrumental in getting uh, Native Plant Field Day uh, coordinated. So not only last year's, but also, also this year's as well. So um, we definitely thank her for, for serving us for those two years and we wish her luck on, those, uh, on her future endeavors. Uh, from the board, I'd like to thank Jeannie, who's always the one who reaches out to presenters for the month. So she's the one who kind of makes, makes these events happen by, by getting us a, a presenter to learn about all the fascinating topics that we always do. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Steve, who is the, uh, the chair of the, uh, the field trip committee. So all the awesome field trips that we get to go to, a lot of these sites, very special, very hard to access sites. It's, uh, it's thanks to Steve for, um, for, uh, for planning those. And he was also the brainchild for Native Plant Field Day. Um, I'd like to thank Lydia uh, for, um, for being our secretary. You know, it's, it's one of those, one of those heavy, heavy duty on uh, roles within, within the chapter, keeping track of everything um, and making sure that it's all, it's all accessible uh, for us. Uh, she also regularly communicates with, uh, with Patty for getting uh, information for the newsletter, which then gets uploaded to the, um, to the website and also sent out to, uh, to you guys. Susan, as our treasurer, we don't operate without money and we don't operate without, without those financials being, uh, being looked at regularly. So Susan always, always helps out with, uh, with uh, setting up the annual budget, uh, which helps us continue doing uh, doing what we do, um, uh, using those funds to continue promoting uh, promoting our mission. Uh, Kurt, who still uh, serves as our past president and uh, and chapter representative, um, and then also Jen Stein, uh, Joey Bazna, and Janine Feiger for their general help throughout the chapter. Um, they're always around for uh, for these events and also for the. Um, uh, for the, the special events like Native Plant Field Day that, we, that we've been having for the past couple of years. Um, and then finally, I'd like to thank everyone else in the room, all the members, all the people who join our, 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 uh, our monthly programs. You guys are the ones that keep the wheels, the wheels going, and without your support, we, we wouldn't be able to do uh, what we do. And to that end, I'd like to welcome uh, quite a few new members. And, uh, and with that, that'll be, uh, that'll be the end of my part here. So welcome to the chapter, Amy Arbuckle, Luis Garcia Falcon, Duke Lamb, Gil Amara, Emmanuel Lubian, Sofia de Car Cardenas, and Mario Gangini, Priscilla Difo, Erica Gonzalez, Paula, Paula Christi Christina Viala, and June Yoshimura. Are any of those names in, uh, in the room right now? Welcome to the chapter, guys. It's great to have you here. All right. So with that said, I appreciate you guys uh, lending me your ears um, very quickly, just so you guys can kind of learn a bit with uh, about the plants that are on the raffle table. Steve, would you like to, uh, to present them? There's going to be a lot of winners tonight if you buy raffle tickets. There's not a lot of people. <laughs> you have to you have to you know pay to play so all right so we got some wonderful natives we got always the wonderful wildflowers that raul brings in and and barbara also brought in some plants that you're probably gonna learn more about in her program so i won't spoil too much about those uh, but i'll just go ahead and start here here we have a scorpion tail, it's Heliotropium angiospermum. And this is a subshrub wildflower that grows on the edges of the hammocks. It's got a white inflorescence, they have white flowers. And they call it scorpion tail because the inflorescence resembles the tail of a scorpion. It's a really good butterfly plant for a nectar plant. It blooms all year. And a lot of the butterflies, even the rare ones like Italas, they like small white flowers. So if you want to attract things like italos and hair streaks, little skippers, the scorpion tail is a great plant for that. And it'll grow in partial shade. So a lot of our yards are already full of plants. 
So it's good for that. We have a very small lignum vitae, a very popular native tree here in South Florida. It's native to the Florida Keys, where it's found all the way from Biscayne National Park in the Keys all the way down to Key West, historically. And uh, very slow growing tree, very pretty, has purple flowers. Um, and it'll bloom a couple times a year, typically. The wood is so hard and dense that it doesn't float, it sinks. And it was coveted for its wood, but uh, it was over harvested in the Keys and that's why it's now state endangered. Uh, they used it in shipbuilding, not to build the ships, but some of the parts in the ship. I think the bearings. <clears throat> we have an assortment of small hammock trees. Um, this is this is for people with green thumbs, I suppose. They're about two or three inches tall for those of you online. Uh, this is a lancewood, which is Nectandra coriacea. Uh, and this is a native tree, medium sized tree with gray bark. It's got lance shaped leaves. It's in the same family as avocado and bays. Um, and uh, this is good if you're trying to recreate a hammock. There's a couple seedlings in this pot. We also have a couple specimens of baby cinnamon bark. This is a slow grower, kind of like the lignum vitae. I know you guys can't really see it. We're kind of deep down in there. Um, this is a primitive angiosperm and it has red flowers that are real pretty and has an inflorescence that is full of buds, but they don't all open at once. But uh, this is a, a spicy leaves. If you bite into them, they'll numb your tongue a little bit. We also have uh, some seedlings of white stoppers. And these guys uh, uh, are famous for, for having aromatic leaves that smell somewhat like a skunk. Um, they're very earthy aroma. If you ever drive down Old Cutler Road through Matheson Hammock Park, sometimes if you have the windows down, you'll smell the white stopper if you're there in the early, late afternoon. It's a small tree. It's great for small yards. It has real pretty white flowers that pollinators, especially bees, like to visit and uh, the, the, it, it attracts birds for the fruit. All these trees that I mentioned, the hammock trees, the lancewood, the cinnamon bark, the lignum vitae, those are all wonderful trees for migratory birds that'll feed on, on the fruits. Uh, we have some seedlings of some live oaks. I'm pretty sure everyone knows about live oak, but even though they're, they're all over Dade County, they are one of the best trees for attracting wildlife. Uh, you know, they, they have acorns that wildlife use, but there's also insects that use it. If you want to attract birds and other wildlife in your yard, you need to attract insects. And, and live oak is a really good tree for that. Uh, we also, goodness gracious, very small uh, black ironwood seedlings. And this is a slow grower like the lignum vitae. So for, for these little one inch tall seedlings, it probably take about three years for them to get about three or four feet tall. So very, very slow, if you're lucky. Um, here we have one of our native sinas. And what I'm doing is I'm looking at the glands at the base of the leaves to see which one. This looks like Bahama Senna, uh, which is the Pine Rockland species, the Privet Senna, which looks very similar, grows on the edge of hammocks. The Bahama Senna uh, and the Privet Senna are both host plants for at least three different sulfur butterflies. Uh, the, the cloudless sulfur is a real common one, but I think you also get the orange bard and something, the sleepy dog, sleepy orange, that's it. Okay. Here we have a, a, a native, Composite in the Asteraceae or the sunflower family. This is sort of a shrubby vine called climbing aster or, or Carolina aster. Uh, the new name for it, it's not that new anymore, is Cynthia trichum carolinianum. It used to be in a genus aster. And this has beautiful purple flowers. Or I should say purple. The ray flowers are purple and the disc flowers are yellow. Um, uh, composites like sunflowers, what looks like a single flower or actually hundreds of flowers. And, and they all play a part in that inflorescence. Uh, so each petal that you see, like on a sunflower, is actually part of a single flower. 
each petal. So, so those are called the ray flowers, and then the middle ones are called the disc flowers. And, and climbing aster is sort of a wetland plant. It grows on the edges of swamps and in marshes. So um, I have, have a lot of experience growing this in my yard, but I would suspect that it needs a little bit wetter soil. We have some wonderful pine rockland species. This is, looks like the ones that Raul grew. Uh, we have the a rare pine rockland species called pine rockland morning glory uh, with real pretty fuzzy little leaves that are sort of heart shaped or peltate actually. And this will have real pretty purple flowers or pink flowers. So if, you're, if you have a pine rockland garden, that's a wonderful addition. That's not always easy to get. Another plant that's hard to get is this federally endangered crinulate lead plant. And this is that now the, the only two natural populations that are known left are at two small parks in Dade County. Uh, this has been reintroduced or introduced into some other areas as well. And it's also grown in a lot of people's yards. Fairchild has done, um, Fairchild Tropical Botanic Garden has done a marvelous job with their Connect to Protect program um, to not only find homes for crinulate lead plants, but also to keep track of them to see you know, how they're doing in people's yard. And crinulate lead plant or amorpha crinulata variety of herbacea is in Dade County and nowhere else in the world. Here we have another small plant that looks like a bledia. Is that really a bledia? Wow. So this is a native terrestrial orchid. It's got pink flowers and they're, they're, they're often self-pollinating. So you'll probably get fruits. Uh, on it. This grows in sunny areas. Um, and uh, this can be found, usually I find it like in disturbed soils where like on the sides of roads or on floating logs in the, in the swamp. So, got five minutes. Here we have uh, the, the common name for, this is Melanthera parvifolia, they call it black anthers. Another common name for it is cat's tongue. If you touch the leaves, they're, they're, they're raspy like a cat's tongue. Uh, this is also in the same sunflower family that has inflorescences that look like snow caps because the anthers are black. So the, the flowers are white and then the anthers are black and they kind of they resemble snow caps uh, that used to buy at movie theaters or for older folks, they, what do they call them, non-parels. This is parvifolia, and taxonomically, it's a bit of a mess. Um, there are new taxonomic guides, so that, that I know this is parvifolia based upon Cronquist treat, treatment, but I think Weekly is calling it something else. I can't remember. Here we have a native milkweed. Everyone's talking about grow the native milkweed. Well, here's here's our giant, one of our giant native milkweeds that might support one monarch caterpillar. This is Asclepias verticillata. Um, this grows in marl prairies. Uh, it's actually one of the native milkweeds that you can keep alive in your yard more successfully than some others. Although uh, they, in my yard, they disappear after three years or so. Um, and uh, so one of the reasons why people don't, native nurseries, they wanna grow the native milkweeds, but we don't is because they're hard to grow. Here we have an assortment of, okay, wait. So we got a blue-eyed grass here. They're all going on one cup, huh? There's three little pots with blue-eyed grass in them, but some of them have bonus stuff. Blue-eyed grass is actually a native iris. It's got little blue flowers, a little yellow center although you can find white forms of it. And it's only a small herb that grows about eight to 12 inches tall and it, and it clumps. So it spreads a little bit, but not horrible. You know, it's not gonna be terribly aggressive and it usually blooms in the winter time. We also have some, some nice, one of the nice little pots, you have a rouge plant with the blue-eyed grass. And the rouge plant is nice for shady areas and it's a really good bird plant. Um, It'll have little red fruits that the birds will eat. And then in the middle, you also have really cool plant, state endangered wild basil, 
which is Ossimum campichianum. And uh, that's another native herb. It looks just like basil you buy at the store, although it's, it's not considered edible. Um, and uh, that's only found in a few sites in Dade County. It's also historic to the Keys. So those are all, well, except for the rouge plant, those are pine rockland species. And then we also have another native aster. We talked about the Carolina aster. This similarly has real pretty inflorescences with purple flowers. Um, this, this species of aster is called scale leaf or clack, scale leaf aster, yeah, which is Cynthia trichomadnatum. And uh, that's a really nice pine rockland plant. And then we have some really pretty members of the acanth family or the petunia family. This is pinklet or stenandrium dulci. And, and pinklet's kind of a neat little plant. It's got these little basil rosettes and then it's got a stalk. That, that sends up with little pretty pink flowers. And this one, when I find it in nature, it kind of grows on the edges between pinelands and prairies. But this one will, will, will spread a little bit in your yard, but it's not aggressive. It's not going to take over. So it's a nice thing. Oh, wow. So we have something, uh, we have a Cynthia trichum simonsii. Hmm. Um, there's another native, Sophia trichum, that has a, a purple flower similar to the adnatum and the Carolinas. This is bigger than the adnatum, uh, usually gets to be about knee high or taller. How, did you bring this in? Okay. How tall does it get? Okay. About waist high. Um, we'll keep moving. Here we have Chapman's goldenrod. It's a native goldenrod. Now, some goldenrods are, are rhizomatous. This is not one of them. So, so this one will stay in its spot. It's not going to just spread and take over. Um, this one, this one would be really nice. We should probably start growing these at the nurseries. Uh, golden rods have yellow flowers and, and the inflorescences. Now, again, it's in the Asteraceae and you'll, the, the heads or the, the inflorescences are all on one side of the branch. They're secund in this species. And this one's named to both pine rocklands as well as other types of flatwoods. Uh, it's a Fairly woody, more uh, barely suffrutescent. It gets maybe about, you know, waist high, maybe a little bit taller. <laughs> All right, I got to wrap things up. Um, we got a crabwood. This is another hammock species. This grows very well. It's very drought resistant. Um, the, it holds onto its leaves so long that they eventually will have lichens growing on the leaf themselves. So this is a very drought tolerant tree. Um, it doesn't have, the fruits are capsules, so the, the, there's no fleshiness for birds to eat, although seed-eating birds can eat the seeds when they fall on the ground. And, and the inflorescences aren't showy at all, but it makes a nice screen and, and, it, and it stays, you know, dense. And if you don't want to rake leaves all the time, it's a really good tree for that. Uh, we have another plant. This one's native to the Keys. This is called butterfly sage or bloodberry. It's, cord it's Veronia globosa. Uh, on, this, on this sheet, it says Cordia. That's the older name for it. And it's in the same family as that scorpion tail. And, and that family is really good for attracting pollinators and butterflies. Um, this one uh, is aptly named, being called butterfly sage, because it's probably one of your best butterfly bushes in your yard. It's weedy, though, and it will spread around. I don't know what that is. That's not native. No, not to hear. Yeah. yeah, I'm not going to talk. I'm not going to talk about that. Mojan tea is from the Bahamas. Um, uh, Barbara also, but I'm not going to spoil uh, the talk. She also brought in some nice pickerel weed, a nice uh, Eleocris, or they also call them spike rushes. We have a butterfly host plant called a water hyssop, and we also have some native violets. Um, there's two trees on the ground as well. Um, this one here is an anona, which is a pond apple, and uh, that's really for wetlands. These are both for wetlands. Um, so if you have a little pond, these would both do well. The other tree next to it, that looks like a black mangrove, which is Avicennia germinans, and uh, uh, that grows obviously on the coast. So if you're near the coast, um, that's a good tree for there. Um, and that's it for the raffle. Oh yeah, go ahead, Patty. I'm sorry, I meant to give it to you.
pretty. It's kind of a bouquet. It's got uh, wild basil growing up here. And I want to give this to Brian oh, as thank a you, thank you because he's been so. If we didn't have a customer, then we that that was a techie guy. Uh, you know, we'd all just be like, you know, standing near <laughs> looking at the drawings on the blackboard or something. And if you don't need it, you can do whatever you want. Well, I, I've been trying to get wild basil for, for a good while. So thank okay. you so much, Patty. And, and I'm tired of taking care of it. <laughs> thank you. That <laughs> Being called the techie guy is about the best compliment as I can ever receive. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much, Patty. Much appreciated. <laughs> well, that's I'm about to cry. <laughs> Barbara, would you like Ooh, to uh, to set up and while you set up the, the audio, I'll present. All right, everyone. Back to the main events. Uh, so just to introduce Barbara, I need to talk to you already know. Uh, she's the head of recording yards and neighborhoods. check and see how much money I have in my wallet for the raffle plants tonight. I forgot. I mean, a lot of the plants you're going to see me talk about all came from Native Plant Society raffle table. So I'm going to pass this out. This is something we need to do at UF. Um, you guys get to grade our present. You can hear me, right? Okay, good. Uh, you get to grade our presentation. And I just want to add that doing the Master Gardener course, uh, it was Amy Creekmer, who was a member also, who uh, talked to me after I had done the certificate in Hort course at UF at Extension Office that said, oh, you got to do the Master Garden. So where I am today is because of Native Plant Society. And it was that love, what got me going on it was hiking with Boy Scouts and looking at what the butterflies were landing on up in Central Florida, you know, and just starting to go, oh, what's the name of that plant? What's the name of that butterfly? And this lady right here, Mary Rose, has always been helpful. So let's get going before I get too gushy and cry too. <laughs> so um, it feels like coming home for you, to you guys. So um, I'm going to go quickly through the first part of this because, uh, go. Uh, first of all, just to acknowledge that we're funded. Our uh, entire Urban Hort team right now, which is six people, is funded by Miami-Dade Water and Sewer Department. So we are uh, partnered with Parks, Recreation, and Open Space. We cost them zero dollars in their budget except for our housing and our truck, um, and we are also partially funded by DERM, Department of Environmental Resource Management, or the department formerly known as DERM, maybe now DERM, and also Solid Waste, which provides the funds for our free composting workshop. So, and we work closely with EELS and NAM and everybody, we're collaborators. We work with everybody. So we cover everything in Miami-Dade County. Doesn't matter who you are. So next. And everything revolves around Florida-friendly landscaping. If you're not familiar with this program, you guys are probably already practicing it. The, the cornerstone of this is right plant, right place. And for us here, it's right native plant in its right space. Steve talked about that, where those plants want to go, what's their niche. And if we get that in alignment, then we will use less water. We won't need to fertilize um, if very little, if not at all. And we'll mulch, we'll use the proper mulch, keep the weeds down. 
We will certainly attract wildlife. Where's that little plant right here? There's a rouge berry. Uh, every time I see a, a black throated blue warbler, it's on that plant in the winter time. So it's a magnet. Um, manage yard pest, recycle, that's composting, reduce stormwater runoff and protect the waterfront. So the entire program, next slide, was actually created by the University of Florida over 26 years ago from a, I think it was a $20,000 grant from um, FDEP um, to educate homeowners because we're the primary source of all of the problems with our water quality and our water use. It's not, it's those little uh, non-point source pollution, millions of them. How many people do we have in Miami-Dade County? So if we just think, and it's still the low hanging fruit on how to keep our bay clean and Biscayne Aquifer clean and full of water. So all the talk about everything that we need to do, start right in your own yard. But I'm preaching to the choir if I'm talking to you guys. So you're already doing it, just for those who'll watch the recording later. So this is what brought me to this program. I thought that it answered a higher calling, it reached out, it provided information to help create little slices of backyard paradises in all of our yards and connect them. So, uh, and we do this, I should mention, for all areas, including developers and uh, residential, but we also do it for the uh, commercial municipal uh, crews that are out there taking care of landscapes and parks and, and public spaces. And we teach everyone from age four to infinity. Next. So there's just a little bit, a lot of the things that you're hearing about, sorry, that slide got stretched, um, is in our green industries best management uh, program. You'll see BMPs mentioned a lot. That's best management. Keep going. Let's just get through. Elements of a Florida friendly landscape. I'm not going to go through each detail of it, but this slide will be available as a PDF. I can send that to you as a PDF and all of the links will be live. And anytime you see an email from me, everything in my signature is linked right to the website. So these are just some of the, the things that you can consider in your landscape. But what I love here is, hey, They've got a rain garden. They've got the swale. Let's make that bio swale there. And they also have a buffer zone. How many of you live on a canal? Your waterfront, very important waterfront. And how many of you live on the bay or a lake? Okay. <laughs> but that's okay. All bodies of water will end up connecting. And also all stormwater runoff. If it has a clean path off the roof, down the hard surface of the driveway into the street, it will connect to waterways as well. Next slide. Tell me to talk faster. <laughs> so a lot of this program is taken from inspiration from EPA's program, Soak Up the Rain. And this began in the New England states because after they got so hard hit by Hurricane Sandy in 2011, they realized they needed to do something. And somehow they didn't have all this politics that got in the way. And they started a lot of programs. And they are still today, I get all of the updates and I will tune in just to see what they're doing that we could be doing. Next slide. So, there it is, it's 28 years I lied. Uh, well, actually it's 29 years coming up on, on 30 next year, keep going. So this is where we are. Steve and I were talking about the weather. Your weather was based on the hole in the donut. My weather was based on what I read on the US drought monitor and what I observed driving all over Miami-Dade County to do outreach programs. 
and what's happening in my own yard. But it's either feast, next slide, or famine. And we're split here. I don't know what happened to summer, spring, winter, fall. We have dry season, we have rainy season. And we have some cool weather. We've got a couple of months now that don't hit 90 degrees, but only a couple of them. <laughs> I think I'm allergic to anything above 90 degrees. <laughs> I'm in trouble. <laughs> so actually, if you, if you look at the calendar year, rainy season is five months, dry season is seven. So everyone thinks that it rains all the time here. It doesn't, but when it rains, it rains big. Next slide. So this is the drought monitor from June 17th, 2021. And you can see here that we have, I don't know where the hole in the donut is, but we had normal, abnormally dry and we had moderate drought in, and this is June. This is a month after the start of rainy season last year. And the year before was even more severe. So yeah, it rains a lot. Uh, what year we had? 100, 100 inches of rain because of the storm, a tropical storm that just parked off of us. That's, it would have been October 2020 because that's when I decided to make the rain garden at my house. Um, it just did one of those things that tropical storms are do, or hurricanes are doing now, park halfway over the uh, Gulf or the Atlantic, half over land and just not move and just dump water. So it did that. Next slide. So here we are, we're nothing like here. And if I got tired of teaching in Miami-Dade County, where do you think I should go? Keep going. But they build their canals out of concrete in California. So that's just what we can uh, expect as we get into those different drought categories and we have we got to go up to um, the Fort Lauderdale Research and Education Center last month and um, Anthony and I who were driving up together at six o'clock in the morning see a glow out there we're going up chrome the back way and we see a glow out there in the Everglades we saw three new spires that had sparked up. And that's not unusual for the Everglades. It can actually be beneficial, but imagine dry conditions, <coughs> people careless with, you know, cigarettes or their barbecue or hot vehicles and having that spark up in the dry season. Keep going. So that year, 2020, I actually got so frustrated, locked up at home during COVID, decided I was looking at my yard and landscape every day, every time I took a break. So I was like, oh, well, let me just start taking some photos and write about how severe the drought is. Well, it was moderate drought. So what to pay attention for. If these plants are wilting during the dry season, Here's my salvia coccinia, not happy. Um, then maybe I have these plants in the wrong place or maybe I shouldn't have them in my landscape at all because maybe they're not gonna hold up under future conditions. Keep going. And of course we have extreme events. Let's just, just go through this. This is part of the perfect storm that really got me fired up. And if you guys remember this, 2018, sorry, before that, 2016, toxic blue-green algae, Loxahatchee, that area. And then two years later, red tide fish kills on the west coast of Florida. And that's a pretty extreme picture, but I was actually just, for me, it was heartbreaking as this came on the news constantly. Now we've seen it, we're aware of it, 
You are aware of it, right? Yeah. Next slide. Just because we aren't seeing it every day, it still happens. So that year, right before we got shut down by COVID, February, for the first time, I got to go to Gainesville to the Sustainable Water Symposium. Finally, my turn, and I'm not there to look at irrigation. Next slide. So what are we talking about that year? Harmful algae, HABs, uh, best practices in climate adaptations, remote sensing and water, ag water and nutrient management, all of these problems that are coming to a head, they're just broiling here in the background. And this is panels, Dr. Payer. I can't, I don't know if I'm, it's not Payer. I don't know if I'm pronouncing his name correctly. Next slide. Was the keynote speaker. And this algae, these outbreaks, they're happening all over the world. We're just not tuning into it. We're just not realizing that it's happening everywhere. Keep going. And then that summer, we get our very own fish kills in Biscayne Bay. So I can't sit still anymore. I don't know if I, we had the, uh, we had the Pine Rackland Symposium. And I said, I'm gonna have to take a break a little bit because I'm gonna have to do a series on what we need to do about this. What, how can we help from our gardens, from what we do in our backyards and in our parks and in our municipal spaces, our buildings, everywhere. Next slide. So again, with the blogs. <laughs> Um, and created a, um, a whole schedule, wrote an article for uh, Coral Gables magazine, keep going, and started looking at the programs that we talked about at the, uh, the Water Institute and what UF IFAS has in publications and what other maybe a little more advanced areas like the far west coast, Washington, Washington State, what they are doing next. Bioretention, sorry, <coughs> bioretention, rain gardens, permeable pavement, minimal excavation. Holy moly, have you seen them building a new housing complex down here? Minimal excavation. You know what the first thing they do is? bring out the biggest bulldozers possible and scrape everything off and then bring in compacted fill. And then guess what I have seen time after time after time. When they go to plant, they just lay out the sod and it has that much soil and it's right on top of sand and rock. And they plant the trees in that and they plant the shrubs in that. And then we wonder why people are like, I have to have my fertilizer. Nothing will grow in my yard. Do you know when you scrape that, off, that soil off, it takes 40 years to build back the soil, the microbes, everything that's beneficial. So <laughs> it's a paradigm change of how we also should be looking at building. That might be a hard sell. But vegetated roots, maybe it won't work so much here, but hey, rainwater harvesting. You know what they call me, the rain barrel goddess. <laughs> Next slide. <laughs> In case you didn't know that, that's what Chris Roll, one of Chris Rollins nicknames for me. <coughs> Sorry, I've lost my, my cup is somewhere in all. By the way, sorry, it's, it's plastic, but I've used it for two months. And I've washed it. So we had Washington, we have Utah, we have the Northeast part of the United States. They've got it. I would love to see something built like this here. And they actually, I've seen uh, some of the um, professors from Gainesville 
pull up slides and it's like this. And I'm like, I just, it's a dream that we would build this way here in Miami-Dade County with disconnect the stormwater runoff. And we have all of this space for the water to like move and settle and not end up as, as runoff. We've got permeable sidewalks. We have rain gardens almost in every, we have common space where everybody can enjoy. It's almost like living within your own little park. Next slide. And there's just another one. They're all over the place if you start looking. We know what to do and we know how to do it. Next slide. We've had this, what we wanna do, just to make it very clear, the goal is to not have rainwater flowing off of your property. Now, in intense storms, if we get 10 inches of rain over a 24 hour period, maybe not, but at my house, it will puddle. And as soon as it stops raining, you can see it do this. So on our natural topography here, that's what we'll do, what the rainwater will do because we have very little soil base and we have more small sand, mostly sand, rocks, and then we start to get quickly into the aquifer and that is all very porous. So there, there's, why are we seeing stormwater runoff? Because of the hard surfaces, because of compacted building practices and, and not realizing that we, we should not have all of these draining in the same direction. So that's the goal is zero effects drainage discharge from your property. Yeah, it's a goal. Some of us are already there and how we build can determine if we can get there in a larger part of Miami-Dade County. Next slide. Keep going. This just goes over the, uh, the definitions of what all of these are. And you're gonna have the link. This is low impact development, LID. Plenty of people all over the United States have figured out how to build this way. So if you're a housing developer and you're like, hmm, you can do it. We do it all over the United States and they do it all over the world too. Keep going. Because we know with climate change, things are gonna be a, a wild rocky ride with, with weather. Keep going. Go, go, go. Arcola Lakes, parks. So this part got selected. Uh, Arcola Lakes is north of 79th Street at about 13th Avenue. I'm going back there to build a community garden, going back there to do a presentation on how everybody can convert their landscape to Florida friendly. But it brought down a National Recreation and Parks Association grant to create a bioswale and we had enough funds to do 50 free rain barrels for the community residents. And then as we, we got shut down by COVID and when it came back online and said, oh, you've got to finish this by October of last year, right? They tell us this in like May. <laughs> and you've got this much money. I'm like, what? Wait a minute. I think we can build a rain garden with that. <laughs> Uh, and I had to go to the wall with everybody on it. Are you sure? So next slide, Whoop, back. This is the Everglades Slough. And this is the Little River. And Little River drains to Biscayne Bay and is one of the primary target areas where you saw fish kill in 2021 or 2020, sorry. I should add that to the story. So yeah, next slide. Yeah, the jelly bean, the jelly bean garden. First it was there, no, we're gonna do stuff here. You have to move it. Landscape architects, okay, 
build it there. Here's the bioswale. Next slide. A lot of work. Next slide. This is all me on PowerPoint. I don't have anything else. <laughs> uh, yeah, here's, here's a whole bunch of parks foundation, uh, park special events. Um, that's the finish. It doesn't look like much yet, but that was right after it was finished and it didn't end up getting put in until like, I think it was September, was it? Um, which is late. For me, that's late in the rainy season to be planting the rain garden. But we had this wild idea, which we had already used before, of getting some redline kayaks. And I guess they become kind of my thing. <laughs> Keep going. Oops, don't look. 30 pounds heavier since COVID. <laughs> oh, well. But there is a Parks Conservation Corps, which is a dedicated group of the, the um, parks. Um, I'm, I'm going to mess it up. Janine, help me. Um, it's Parks Special Volunteer Events. And we have them, I think we have about six of them each year, like Martin Luther King Day, um, Earth Day. We're, we're going to have several of them. If you guys connect with me, if you put your email on there, I will keep you informed of anything that's coming up that you can be part of. But guess what this, uh, this rain garden consisted of? Almost 100% native plants. Next slide. So here's the bioswale that um, got contracted out. And there's our volunteers cleaning up. Next slide. So there they are. We also were able to make them this beautiful pop-up banner and some trifold posters. And everybody who showed up to volunteer that day um, got a free plant and about 70% native, except for the milkweeds, you know, they're hard. <laughs> it's hard to find, where's that guy go? <laughs> yeah, next slide. Okay, so let's go rain gardens. First of all, rain gardens, bioswales, uh, all of those features are not meant to hold water for more than 72 hours. So they're meant to slow the storm water, the rainwater that might become storm water down so it can have time to be absorbed into and recharge the Biscayne Aquifer. So there should not be issues with mosquitoes. Next slide. And um, there's papers on that, storm water detention and retention areas. So next slide. We, we have ways, if the water is going to stand in a pond for longer, that is not a, a rain soaker feature. That is something that could breed mosquitoes. We have publications on how to deal with that. Fish would be a good thing for one. So this is off of EPA's uh, Soak Up the Rain website, and it's not attributed and I think this is an excellent guideline. UF doesn't have a publication on rain gardens as such. We have them on ponds and, and other features, but not exactly rain gardens. Some of the things that they talk about doing here, like a perforated pipe to outlet if needed, we shouldn't need that here because we're not, we don't need the gravel bed, do we? We already have the lime rock bed, <laughs> so, um, and some of the things that they talk about, we've, we've already got it covered because of the, our type of our soil here. <coughs> but they have a little path, which is interesting, and keep it 10 feet away from structures. You don't want, you want to move rainwater away from the foundation of your house always. We talk about that when we look at building rain barrels as well. Keep going. <coughs> so there's October with that little tropical system which became a hurricane that dumped all the rain. And uh, I was trying to start my pine rockland garden 
Lydia. <laughs> and I decided not a good spot. <laughs> and by the way, I don't drink wine. Those are all collected from members of the Tropical Fruit and Vegetable Society of Redland. <laughs> uh, next slide. That's what the old house looks like. It's on property at the Fruit and Spice Park. It's a hundred years old, uh, made out of Dade County pine. And that, trying to find that is before I moved in. I've been there for 12 years, let's go. So this was the first kind of sad looking. And um, by the way, I acknowledge my mistake in planting red cloak. It gets ginormous. It actually branches down and starts new plants and will create an impenetrable forest that, but the birds love hiding out in it. And it has little white flowers because the red is actually adapted leaf bracts that are turned red. Move the burly marks out, eh, not native, but I do use it in the shade. And big problem, crinum asiaticum. Next slide. So there, you know, there's a couple of months later and uh, this is all me with a uh, breaker bar or spud bar. Can I tell you a quick Halloween story? I'm out there in October and I'm trying to get this spot and I'm, I get a rock and I'm like rocking it back like this and all of a sudden it gives and the breaker bar hits me right here, rang my bell and I go shake it off. We're gonna get this in the ground. And all of a sudden I realize that blood is flowing down my face. And I'm like, I still have a little groove here. <laughs> and I learned you do not put ice on a bleeding scalp. Don't you want to let it, you don't want to clot it. And I was like, oh my God, I'm glad I live out here in the country because if what if someone saw me with blood running down my face? So I called, I called 911 and I go, it's not an emergency, but I hit myself in the head and my head is bleeding. And I just talked to someone. <laughs> So yeah, it's okay. Put your head down, let it flow. So anyhow, that was mine. A lot of stories like that. But uh, yeah, the knees, uh, if I complain about my knees, it's from all that work. And I just, someone, they asked me for the state chapter, what did it cost me to build this? The biggest cost on this was the P-Rock at $2 a bag. And I keep hauling it in my little, Kia Forte, 10 bags at a time, because that's 500 pounds, 50 pounds per bag. And I don't know how many trips I made, but it was like P-Rock, P-Rock, P-Rock. And I kept, this is by, by the way, this is a uh, telephone pole, which I figured out how to move all by myself. Me and the spud bar, but I'm a much more careful now. It's leverage. So I could build Coral Castle, maybe. Um, so anyhow, next. Oh, big mistake. Next slide. You can see it started, and, and there's there's a couple of my pine rockland plants. Obviously, in the wrong place. Going to get wet like mad because of the roof overhang over here and the rain barrels over here, but the water is being directed to flow here and down here. Next slide. Bacopa monterey growing in really well. Pickerel wheat growing in really well. Next slide. And I decided, what do I want to do next? The crinum lilies, which I thought, oh, they're so fragrant. My goodness those big clusters of flowers and they had those big seeds and one plant just grew into this huge clump. And the next year, right after I took this, this is, I don't know, about February of last year, they have emerged 
another blog. Because guess what found a crying of lilies? Thousands of them, like from a nightmare. Next slide. <laughs> Luber grasshoppers. Oh my gosh. And I thought, I'm going to put them in a bag because I want everybody to see this. Oh my goodness, they start pooping immediately. And it's like, it's just, you know. So I had to go, this is what, these, these started to just look awful. And they would not only eat the, the crinum, but I mean, well, yeah, I have some, you know, non-native plants too, but um, there, as they start, as they finish this, they're looking for other things. So um, I guess I went, uh, I don't know, I kind of went walking dead with a machete and I hacked and hacked and hacked on this. And uh, it, it took me about eight months to get rid of it, but I've gotten it where I can, I can jump on it and get it. Next slide. Oh, and the lubers emerged even earlier this year but they're far less. So now I just grab them. Sorry, I'm kind of Buddhist, but I just got over it with those guys. Had to. So you can see everything's growing and you can see, oh yeah, you gotta keep hacking them. And you gotta get up all of those little seed pods too. And do not throw them in the compost pile they went to the burn pile at the fruit and spice park. So, yeah. So, rain barrels and my um, my Thakahatchee grass keep going. We gotta get to the plants. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. There's a good rain finally. That's what happens. And the pickerel weed. Picture taken from my car. I should have gotten out and gotten closer, but I was like, I have to take a picture of this before I go off to work today. Next slide. Oh yeah, and you saw that kayak, right? So inspiration from this, which I found on the website from Vicki uh, Scurry on the, the balls. Now I collect glass balls. <laughs> I collect balls. <laughs> Okay, I you knew a little Roger Hammer was gonna slip in there, <laughs> sorry. Um, but curbside rain gardens, bioswales, um, rain gardens, what size you make them, keep going. What we wanna look at, oops, why did I put that here? I can't remember. Oh yeah, it was when I was starting to build the rain garden. Okay, what do I have? Let me use it. By the way, did y'all know that Jimmy Buffett writes books too? And this is a line from Where is Joe Merchant? <laughs> Keep going. Did you know that, Mary? <laughs> Not a Jimmy Buffett fan? Yeah. So right plant, right place, cornerstone again. Let's go. What did I already have? Well, I had rain lilies, non-native. I had kiss me quick, native. Oh yeah, scorpion's tail. Um, Iris virginiana, not native. Steve would kick it off the table, just like, sorry, this plant from the Bahamas. I don't hurt. So next slide. And I had lots of coral rock and we had all of these publications. This is a, a stormwater pond on the littorial slope. What needs to be submerged? It's not ever going to be submerged. So if I wanted to have any submerged plants, I had to fake it with some little containers in the kayak. So, but I could have these edge plants, the slope and water's edge, and maybe even some of the top is where I could have trees. I haven't gone that far. By the way, my favorite, keep going. My favorite, keep going. 
let's let's get to the plants my favorite aquatic tree aquatic edge tree stop is a uh, sweet bay magnolia magnolia virginiana which we just don't see here anymore roger hammer has one he's supposedly collecting seed for me i'm gonna have to remind him lydia's supposedly collecting seed for me come on you can do it for me oh my gosh well citizens for better south florida had some we grew them out and we put them on a lakeside the boys and girls club in north miami beautiful magnolia flower only that big lemony smell beautiful larval host of the tiger tail swallowtail is it tiger tail swallowtail don't know falling asleep sorry next slide what we don't ever want to use next slide are the non-natives the non-natives next slide the invasive go, go back not to use a lot of people when they think aquatic gardens they they go immediately to these plants that have found their way here that are invaders and cause huge huge problems keep going so if it's not native just walk through and you guys will get this if it's not native then it will probably become or already is invasive keep going this is a whole presentation it repeats often it just repeated on the state uh, native plant societies keep going uh, presentation list it is almost impossible very few biological controls mechanical doesn't work all the time and it it's chemicals are resorted as a last as a last resort so just don't don't do it don't someone gave me a, a water hyacinth for christmas sorry in a garbage bag as soon as they left in the dumpster do pickerel weed instead keep going so do not plant these are the uh terrible eight never ever ever use memorize them and just don't use them and it's all over um it used to be florida exotic pest plant uh website but now it's all under uf ifas everybody got together and these plants are on there if you ever have any questions if you're gonna you want to do a rain garden or a pond just send me an email or call me next so here's here's where i go all the time um if you get if you're if you subscribe to uh, their newsletter, um, you'll see there's two of us that get pointed out as uh, sustainable um, contributors. Because this website, I believe in it so much, and Steve was part of the, the origins of this, origins of this, that I donate a whopping $50 a month and environmental educators don't make as much money as school teachers okay hence <laughs> so this is i put my money where my heart is because this is like my bible and this and other websites keep going um i don't know why that slides in there oh because I would love to do a presentation on all of the ways that you can use Institute for Regional Conservation's website, particularly if you are working in a natural area. They actually have paid for by Durham many years ago, an inventory of plants by natural areas. So before we do anything like at Camp Mahatchee, which we're working on with Girl Scouts, go to the list of what's next door at Matheson Hammock and make sure we don't deviate from that plant family and look at what's invasive there so we know what to look for we know we have a huge whole fields of invasives at camp mahatchee we're getting to it um keep going 
So the, the type of plants you want to look for are bayhead, dome swamp, marl prairie, prairie hammock, strand swamp, swale. Keep going. And this is just, um, I forget which one I'm looking at here, but it, it'll start out when you use that website and you go to, you got, how many of you use Institute for Regional Conservation's website? Yeah, I'm preaching to the choir again, right? So you know you go to, um, what's it called? Uh, Natives for Your Neighborhood. And you can pull up your plant list based on your zip code. But before you start diving into the candy of that plant list, yummy, look at all these plants and they have these little thumbnails now. You click and it opens up to all this information. Look at your habitat list and decide what habitat am I in within this zip code? And look at the plants for that type of habitat. But within any particular landscape, you might have little different kind of mini or micro habitats within your landscape. Like I've got that wet side of my house, right? So got the trees first, keep going. And then the smaller, I've got that alligator lily, keep going. So this disturbed wetland, that's a list of, this is what you were going to see along ditches, canals, and in pits where they've dug out the rocks. Let's go. Let's get to the, oh yeah, that's a great website too. You guys have been on that one, right? Okay, keep going. <laughs> and where do you, that's also on that website. Keep going. So everybody loves pond apple. Start with a couple of trees, but pond apple might be overplanted. However, I did get into a discussion um, that along the Miami River years ago, pond apples grew along the Miami River and they hosted uh, the ghost orchids. Well, I think that was a long time ago. And now we have pond apple just seems to reproduce, but, but I'll get it because it is a major host for a orchids and bromeliads, and it attracts beetle pollinators. So if it's a plant in the right place and it provides for pollinators, that's it for me, let's go. So just a little bit about the ghost orchids. This is an excellent, uh, it was produced by Audubon, but it is now, uh, it's available, you can watch it. It's chasing ghosts. If you haven't watched this, and if you have watched it, and it's been a couple of months, watch it again. <laughs> Keep going. <laughs> so there's my favorite tree. And guess what? It's also a larval host for a butterfly. So anytime I talk about plants for any type of habitat, I'm gonna point out the butterflies. Sorry, I guess I gave it away. Yeah, next slide. But there she is. Hasn't been seen outside of Everglades National Park in years. Next slide. So there's my little baby. Got a couple of those over here. Bacopa monori. I haven't been able to get the blue one. And this one will just get munched down by white, pe white peacock uh, butterflies. They'll find that and they can eat it up, but um, it will come back and it likes to stay moist. But I've noticed that if it does kind of die out during the dry season, then um, it, it will come back as long as it doesn't get just totally dust, it'll come back. Next. So there is a field in a park I shall not name, just a hole about half the size of this room full of Bacopa monorite and the butterflies all over it. Next slide. Amazing things you get to see when you're in the parks. So there's just a little bit about white peacocks. 
they have these hairy black spiny caterpillars and then you'll go oh my god what is that it's a white peacock and i dare you to find the the crystal list on those so i'm sure some of you guys can find it but its other favorite uh larval host is phylonota flora next slide all right steve's out of the room right this one's not really native to, to South Florida. Oops. Um, it's uh, Iris Virginiana. It's more central to North Florida. Somehow I happen to come by it. It does survive down here, but I do need to keep it in a container where it doesn't totally dry out. And it just finished flowering profusely. Iris hexag hexagonal is our native but very, very difficult to find. So um, I grew up in North Florida, even though I was born here and driving out on the, you know, we went for a drive on Sunday after Sunday lunch and just seeing these grow in the, in the wet ditches. So they, uh, they feel a warm, they make a warm spot in my heart. Next slide. So Porter weed. This does not like to be wet during the winter, but it is great for along the edges, that drier part of the slope. And it is also, oh, there was Miami Springs after, after Wilma, my house after Wilma. And you can see the iris, you can see the porter weed, you can see the spike rush, so maybe it isn't ball windy. You can see how tall it is. Next slide. Um, and also, uh, Sagittaria lancifolia, duck potato sounds sort of. I like th this is one time when the scientific name sounds sexier than the common name. Um, this is just dragonflies love to perch on these for some reason. Um, I've seen different insects on them collecting nectar, um, but they will spread their seed and multiply. Next slide. And there they are in a big pen. So some of my plants, I, I do, I guess, kind of not let them off the leash because I don't have a lake or a pond or a canal in my backyard. <laughs> Next slide. Oh, by the way, back up. That uh, Veronia bulata, which I brought all the way here, 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 and you could go all the way here. That is from one little plant in my yard. So it, it used to be called Cordia globosa, and it would get globulous. So, but it is a major pollinator magnet. Next slide. Be still my heart, pickerel weed, uh, not water hyacinth for purple. This is much more vibrant. This one's getting ready to flower. The leaves on these are a little chlorotic. They've been in a container. Every now and then you have to, if you have them in a container, where they're, if they're not gonna get enough water within a, a situation in your landscape, you're gonna need to break them out and repot them because they'll keep spreading and they'll just use up all the nutrients in the soil. And we don't use fertilizer, right? Not in an aquatic setting ever. Next slide. So water issues in our landscapes and gardens. There was actually Arcola Lakes bioswales. And I hope I put this slide in. Next, I got it. I have a slide going of of a photo of going over on I-75, going over Payne's Prairie, going into Gainesville. Have any of you ever been there, taking that drive in the summertime? And you just see purple all the way to the horizon. So that's why I love that plant. Now, the little, um, I could have brought this, but I forgot, um, Portulaca pilosa survives in dry 
I like it in those rocks around my rain garden. And it's okay if it gets wet, it doesn't, you know, unless it stays submerged, it will survive. And it doesn't like to be in too much sun, I found the last couple of years, they've suffered. Next. And is it ball winning? Maybe not. It says four to 12 inches. We'll have to, we'll have to figure that one out. But I got this off the raffle table at Native Plant Society about 12 years ago. That's what it was tagged at at the time. Of course, we live and learn. So all of it that I have has grown from that one plant. So uh, it will spread. Two, two warnings. Do not put this someplace where you don't want it to mix in with other plants in your, in your rain garden. And don't put the Sagittaria lancifolia where it might get into say the pickerel weed because it'll, it'll just start to take over. But if you like that mixed look, I happen to love it, go for it. Next. And this will grow in wet conditions or dry conditions, larval host for three different butterflies and so many pollinators. The list of pollinators that will visit this is next. There's one of them, common buckeye, not so commonly seen in our yards. Next. Phaon crescent, again, not so commonly seen. How many of you seen a phaon crescent? How about a common buckeye? Next. And there's what it looks like if you get down nose to, to nose. That's an ant's eye view of it. To get it that thick, oh, beautiful. I finally got in mine after three years of struggling pulling weeds out. I've gotten it to grow nice and thick. Next slide. Uh, Fakahatchee grass. So I picked a grass. Why did I pick the biggest grass? Can anyone guess why I picked the biggest grass? Larval host plant for two different butterflies. And finally, after planting in October 2000, mine is flowering now, so it's this tall. And I will never give it a crew cut. Because all of the dead leaves, which everyone finds so unsightly, they're all at the bottom. Just get your hand trowel and coax them out like you're getting the tangles out of your hair. Don't, don't give it the crew cut. Next slide. So there's a little three spotted skipper and I'll see it taking nectar on the pickerel weed. Next, just a delicate little butterfly. Molly grass, loves that moist. All of the links are here, pinelands, marl prairies and marshes, tells you where next. Who doesn't want that? I mean, it only blooms once a year like that, but next. Oh, I learned tonight that this is actually a little miniature orchid. I mean, miniature iris. Um, and I love this, but the only time I have been successful growing this and keeping it alive is in the kayak. So next. And there's the kayak at the office. This is not a good shot. The actual photograph that I just took, I didn't update, but this is blue-eyed grass here. That was four pots like that. And it has filled up that much of the kayak. Of course it is under irrigation. Cheating, right? But it flowered, oh my gosh, knock your eyeballs out. And right here is a little plant someone brought in for identification, Savannah Faults Pimpernel. Pimperel, Pimperel. Remember the Scarlet Pimperel? Now it's buried under the um, rock fruit. And the irises took off. So that is kind of a show piece. It's painted gator orange but it's also a big old grow pot. So next time we do a project, I'll just get the shovel in there.
And you know one of the reasons why this helps retain the water and keeps it from running off is I actually dug a pickerel weed out of this huge uh, water trough that I had, a livestock trough, and I had to turn it over because I couldn't get the shovel in there. Everything was fine root hairs, just full of fine root hairs. So just pulling all the, anything that could be harmful that might find its way into a body of water, pulled it right out and into the plant. Next. So I know we need to get through, let's just keep going. I think it's, is it everybody's bedtime? <laughs> I don't, wait a minute, we're gonna miss the season, the, the, the end of This Is Us tonight. <laughs> At least we won't watch the Marlins lose. <laughs> Next slide. So there's, anytime there's a, a butterfly involved, I'm always gonna point it out. They need our help. We have 39 butterflies that are in various stages of decline. Four of them are endangered. I have a membership with Miami Blue and I encourage all of you to join together because it's the native plants that support the butterflies and the pollinators and all wildlife. Next, there they are. Aren't they cute? Are you in love? Next, next. So ray lilies aren't native either, but I think I found one that might be native. Keep going. But it's this one, which doesn't really grow here. But this is a, a, a Jarrett Daniels slide off of his um, making pollinator gardens everywhere. And this is a roadside garden up just north of Gainesville. So as long as it doesn't become invasive, per Florida friendly landscaping, we're okay with it. But invasive is crossing the line and that's violating the golden rule of plants. They should do no harm. Next slide. Further, not only should they not do any harm, they should provide. I'll make a caveat to that. So here's my little Be Still My Heart Violets next. And uh, when I did this presentation for the state chapter, it was right before Valentine's Day. So do you know how rare a bouquet of, of violets is, are? I mean, you can probably only find it on the streets of Paris at the right time of year. It's like an extreme luxury. Luxury and edible. They taste as good as they look too. I'm sorry, don't tell them. So, I mean, the Tropical Fruit and Vegetable Society likes to put them on their little ice cream concoctions from all the tropical fruits. But um, that's a, again, a plant from my childhood. My grandmother always had a patch of violets growing in the, in the vegetable garden. And so it's, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go, ooh, uh, every time I see it. I think we're finished. Go. Flip my Florida yard if you haven't washed it yet. What are you waiting for? They still haven't done one. They did, however, this one, which is a, native plant yard in the villages. And the villages has a native plant society chapter. Go right there on the edge of the golf course. This guy has an amazing yard full of native plants and buku rain barrels too. So I'll send you the link on this. We got to do a flip, but I was not involved in selecting the plants. Next. <laughs> Um, there's all the staff. We, you met Dalton. We have now Dalton, uh, Tony, and Veronica. Um, besides the originals, Laura, Jesus, and myself that have been there for like 15 years. So next slide. This again was done um, earlier in the year for the state chapter. This is past. Um, Jarrett Daniels did a presentation for us for the Miami Blue chapter meeting um, February 6th. And 
you have a question about what to do about monarchs, this may not answer all your questions. It may actually open up more questions, but we have the, the, mayor, the monarch pledge that the mayor of Miami-Dade County is behind. We have various people weighing in. Oh, you can't plant this and that's not really native. And so what do you do for monarchs? Um, this, this goes uh, quite an in-depth look into how unique a situation a problem complex this is here for us in South Florida because we just don't have a profuse amount of native milkweeds to support monarchs and we think that they may have migrated in the past but they no longer migrate so to look at around this issue and understand it a little better but maybe not have concrete solutions uh, I would love for you guys to watch that it's on our our um, miamiblue.org page. So still searching. I heard that Connect to Protect is trying to grow some native milkweeds. Go Lydia. But of course, you know, I asked her, well, do we have any growing yet? And I'm like, duh, they wouldn't be growing because they're, they're annual, they're not perennial. And I'm asking you in February, do you have any plants? No, hello. The seeds would still be laying on the ground, ready to sprout up during the start of rainy season. So when our monarchs should be coming back. So I don't know. There's 39 other butterflies that I'm plenty worried about. And we know the native plants that they need. So I'm done. And didn't add it to the slide, but I will be doing a rain barrel workshop at the fabulous Fruit and Spice Park on Sunday. And we'll be, after that, we'll be at uh, Amelia. So please, if, you, if I didn't point it out, what feeds my rain garden in the dry season are two rain barrels. So if I don't want something to totally die out and lose it, I've got free, never touch the aquifer water readily available, even if it is a little unnatural, but yeah, if you're gonna have rain aquatic plants, you gotta try to keep their habitat for them. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, did you So I will send it to um, I will send it to you guys and we'll have all the links. Thank you. You can put she talks too much on here if you want. <laughs> I already know it. Thank you. I'm not looking.